Greetings in the Lord Jesus. It's always an honor to be able to join you, and I never tire of telling you that. I think of pastors at churches and others that it's just a, another Wednesday or another Sunday, and I, I don't think that way. I spend a lot of time with our Lord and uh, hours in, in Scripture and just preparation for uh, the time we get together. And it is family time, and this is our time to get together. I have people that I get so many <laughs> uh, questions and, and comments that uh, if I can't get that, all of those, and Kimberly and Luke watched very carefully for me, but I uh, wanted to ask, can I join the family? If you are born again and you're watching us as thousands are around the nation and around the world, and let me welcome in our wisdom warriors, our sage warriors, and intercessors. And of the thousands around the world, we probably have 800 to 1,000, it varies, of intercessors that we can call on and united together pray according to what the Holy Spirit uh, has given to me and as well as uh, to you, the body. Uh, it's our time to come together. And one of the things I look at, whether you a place of safety, a, a harbor, peaceful, is that this family time and when I post on different platforms, um, we make sure that uh, everything is constructive, that you're uh, cordial and, and polite with one another, as we know you will be. Um, when it comes to some of the sites that there's a lot of negativism and back and forth is we need a place where we can come and study the meat of the word as the Bereans did, study the word and know that. And, and when you're right, and I'll show you today with Kimberly and I, and Luke is part of that, that your prayers are kept confidential. And now that we're on almost three years, uh, we knew that. And the people that know me know, uh, you know, knew that. But over three years now, we have never uh, written you and asked you for something. Uh, the only time that I have uh, asked for something is prayer uh, about our home. And many of you have prayed me through the double pneumonia and <laughs> break me through the vertigo and all the attacks is there are physical attacks. And then as a, a friend of mine down in Florida noted, there are definitely spiritual attacks. And when you are uh, positioned by the Holy Spirit to teach uh, and to have a friendship with the Lord Jesus Christ is very costly. Uh, the higher the level of anointing, the higher level of authority I've said before is not only the responsibility, but the accountability. And I embrace it for our family, that I want to be able to come to you in love, come to you and just being candid and, and teaching you and asking you to look at the scriptures, study the scriptures, some of the historical documentation and other uh, reference materials I provide for you, and then you make a decision. Please don't ever pass along to someone that, uh, I believe this because Jim said it. Jim looks at the word of God, and if the word of God is confirmed with you, and then you own it. And when you own it, whether we are no longer on any of the platforms, as is coming in the future, you have that to yourself. So I say that often, and I don't tire of saying it, is that I want my family members, Luke and Kimberly, that they know the word of God and they can stand on the word of God. And as I open today, I want to share part of that with you uh, about some of the things that uh, people have written, but there are certainly medical things and we get, don't ever stop sending your prayer request in. If you think it's trivial, it's not because if it's important to you, then it's important to the Lord. And for Kimberly and I, and Luke joins us, whatever is important to him and you are, it's important to us. You can share with us. And many have written and said, I like this because if I were to share this in my prayer group or share it at church, I think they may look down at me or judge me one way or the other. And um, I know where I've come from. I know my days in the Marine Corps. There was me before, which kind of a 
easygoing, good kid in high school, the Marine Corps years, and then many years of the Lord moving me through a process further away from that military mentality that I had. But I love the military and I love this nation. Many have written that uh, have gone through surgeries and are recovering. There are others that are facing surgeries and very difficult, life-threatening type surgeries. Uh, again, to me, no surgery. I've had 45 outpatient uh, surgeries because uh, of a, something to do with the Marine Corps. Uh, 45, and I probably need 10 or 15 more, but I'm just too tired, and I think I'm getting those gray hairs. Where I don't like that scalpel on me and stitches and all that stuff anymore. But let me touch on this for um, those that write in and, and their questions. So the assurance in Christ, and I'm going to do my best to follow my notes because uh, dads and moms and grandmothers and grandfathers and kids, you, can, you know, you always give me grace when I come over and, and share with you and, and try and pronounce words that I know I can't pronounce, but I do know what they mean. And I have an understanding of the word of God for uh, actually uh, in this year, it'll be, I guess, 48, 49 years officially of being filled with the Holy Spirit. The prayer requests and questions that come to the family, the assurance in Christ, uh, questions for salvation for many reasons often occurs during tests and trials. It's natural. We are in this natural body and we face spiritual enemies. Uh, I'll talk about that another time, but he gave me a, a, a vision of something the other night and it's military. They have a mission, their mission, their soul to mission. As I told you, if you were able to look into the realm of evil, uh, it's not something you want to do, but if the Lord has you do that, they're driven by fear and hatred, fear among themselves and fear among those that are over them. But they have an absolutely an absolute hatred for those that are filled with Christ. And you know what the word of God says. You are either filled with the spirit of Christ or you are filled with the spirit of Antichrist. And there is no in between. You can say, well, they're such a good kid and they're so nice. My question is, I am very thankful that you have a, a good child, a good grandchild, uh, grown. Uh, but do they know Jesus? Do they have him in their heart? Because Jesus said it very clearly. You're either with me or you're against me. And all I can do is tell you what he said and, and say it clearly for uh, us to know and understand. But this question is, you know, I'm not for sure I'm saved anymore. I'm going through so many things and so many battles, and I prayed about alcoholism. I prayed about drug addiction. I prayed about nicotine. I prayed about different habits that people write. When you are born again, I want you to understand something. When you, Luke, Kimberly, and I, we are born again, and I'm going through the different phases, and finally I've gotten to the point where when it's happening, I just say, you know, this is on you. <laughs> You started this whole thing. You made it possible that I could come here. And according to your word, it says Philippians 1, 6, being confident in yourselves. No, of other people around you. No, uh, being confident of this very thing that he, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, the Christ, the anointed one, he hath begun a good work in you and will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. It didn't say he will almost perform it. Or if you mess up somewhere along the way, you're a knothead and you're no longer uh, in that process. That is not true. It showed me one time years ago uh, uh, taking a uh, car out of a junkyard and it was on cinder blocks. And he started adding pieces to it and pieces to it and pieces to it. And it was a long process. But when he, he got through it, it looked like it just came off the showroom floor. But the car, it wasn't up to the car to put headlights and new fenders and paint job. It wasn't up to the car. It was up to the person fashioning the car. Uh, and that's what he's doing with you. And that's what he's doing with me. Uh, you're where you're at now. He's already seen ahead to where you're rejoicing with him at the banquet. So as I can say, he, that word is the Greek 1728. Okay. Used two times in this case. He, God, hath began to make a beginning. That's the Greek, 
Seven, five, six means a beginning. You have to start somewhere, so it's a beginning. Will perform is the Greek two, zero, zero, five is used 11 times. To bring to an end, to accomplish, to perfect, execute, and complete. That's his job description as a father. That's my job description as a, as a husband who loves his wife with all his heart and a, as a dad who loves his son with all, uh, all my heart is that I am responsible for certain things with them. And I, and I cannot, you know, push that off on someone else. I am the husband and the father. It's my responsibility. Just like our dad, he is our father. Through Jesus Christ, the image of the father, the expressed image of, of the father, as he told Philip and Thomas, is it, it's up to him. He took this responsibility on, and he didn't make a mistake. I'll tell you before, someone had thought it was funny or something sent me that some person had said, um, I'm glad he chose me before the foundation of the world because if he if he chose me if he saw me now he probably wouldn't choose me. Yes, he would. Every day of the week, he knows what he's doing. He knew the end from the beginning. So I'm taking time in the very beginning of this to assure you, we get so many that write in so many different ways. I've had several miscarriages. I've had. Are you born again? Do you belong to Jesus Christ? Until, that word until is the Greek 891. The idea of terminus, like in a contract, it's over, it's, it's fulfilled, it's complete. Completion of time. As far as until, when I'm thinking about the contract and completion, the one thing I have asked you to pray about is this housing situation. Uh, with so many people moving to Florida, Texas, and Arizona, uh, they expect in a few years that Fort Worth, Dallas, Arlington, McKinney, Frisco, they won Metro with over 25 million people. Uh, our next door neighbor moved in from Chicago across the street from New Jersey. Um, for them, the cost of living is not a big deal here compared to where they came from. But it's, it's beyond what my family can. So we're going out of uh, the area to, to look for a place this weekend. So keep us in your prayers, if you would. It's never easy, especially at this point in, in, your, in your life. So we are created anew. We become a new spiritual being before the Lord, right? We have put on the new man. Today's lesson, and I want you to hear this, because I, you know, my lesson is so important. It's not my lesson. The lesson that he has for me to teach as best I can on the Holy Spirit, and that's, he, he has a little bit to work with, not much, but I do the best I know to yield is today I'm going to talk about an important subject that they just don't have it right in doctrine, denominational doctrines and, and most others, the body, the soul and the spirit. Most people couldn't tell you what the difference is between the soul and the spirit. And we'll get into that today. Uh, the body probably next week. We have put on the new man. We have put on the new woman. Right. When it says man, it just that term is mankind. But I like to put on the new man and the new woman. Colossians 3, 10 and 11. For those listening in your truck or while you're working on cars or what, whatever you're doing. Colossians 3, 10, 11. And we have put on the new man, new woman, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Father, Son, Holy Spirit where there is neither Greek nor Jew nor circumcision, uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond, nor free. But Christ is all and in all. I want you to see a few things in that. I have told you, and there are not many people that grasp this. It took the apostle Paul, Jesus Christ himself teaching him because he, it was so different it was different than what the jewish people and paul was a pharisee is there are saints in the old testament and i showed you where that ended with john the baptist then there will be tribulation saints the time at this point this thing called the ecclesia or the ecclesia it's a whole new creation it's not a man it's not a woman it's not of those things that we identify in this realm and look at that word also, Scythian. 
You want to talk about Gog and Magog in the future? Scythian. That's those lower regions of Russia. All of those, and it goes back to the Scythians, and I'll talk about the Scythians sometime. Worse than barbarians. You see where it says uncircumcised, then barbarian, then Scythian? They were considered worse than barbarians, unlearned, un, you know, untrained, bonder free. So I want to, for those that write me, I will assure you each and every time that you have genuinely accepted the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart. And you have asked him. It doesn't have to be an elaborate prayer. It doesn't have to be some great thing. Just say, Lord, uh, basically what I did when Roy Stock still came to pray with me. I did some negotiating ahead of time. <laughs> That's a different is I said, Lord, I need you, period. You know, I'm, I'm a sinner and I need to be washed. And it was that was it. So it wasn't some great elaborate prayer. I didn't have to go to a, a priest. I didn't have to go. I didn't have to go anywhere. Luke came in our room when he was seven years old, his birthday. Uh, at night, we're in bed reading, and he said, knocked on the door. I said, Daddy, can I come talk? I said, sure, son. He said, I think I want to invite Jesus in my heart tonight. It's my seventh birthday, and, and I want him in my heart. And he could, at age seven, he could probably give a message. He understood what he was talking about. So when the heart, when the Lord moves on you and in your heart, you know you are changed. You're different. All that ultimately matters is that the Lord Jesus Christ dwells in all of his people. And he wants to be all that they will ever need. He is all that I ever need from an all-in-all -all standpoint. And he has blessed me with a wonderful, God-fearing wife and an amazing son who in May, the Lord willing, will graduate <laughs> uh, from ORU. And I'll give you some updates. Uh, he's getting his robe, all those things. All that matters is the Lord Jesus Christ is the living water that they will have begun to partake of and that he makes us one. What does it mean he makes us one? That's a very interesting concept. And people brush over that. They have no idea what he's talking about. Father, I want them to be one as you are in me and I am in you that they may be in us. They don't know how to teach that. And that is one of the most important lessons that we'll learn this side of heaven. First Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, one body, one unique body called the ecclesia. They say church in the New Testament. That word church is the ecclesia or the ecclesia, the new thing he created. Again, Jew or Greek, slave, free, having made to drink into one spirit. See the capital S? When you're reading in the word Notice the difference when it shows a capital S and a small s. It is a tremendous distinction between the two. How is this possible? How do I do this? Those that are listening say, you know, I don't know how to do that. It's a simple process, but be sure you're, you're sincere about it. Uh, somebody, <laughs> I, my notes and I, you know, my family members, <laughs> have, I have, you know, talk to me during the, by the way, I just uh, thank you for the hummingbirds. And I get hummingbirds, I get eagles, I get blue jays. I get so many beautiful cards. And I, I assure you, every one of them just about brings tears to me. And, and I love each one of them. So I want to thank you for that and, and the different things that you send. They never do not go unnoticed and appreciated. So, so how is that possible? Romans 10, 9 through 13. And that if you, any of the listening, shall confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Paul said the gospel is simple. It's the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. There's the gospel in three points. Verse 10. For with the heart, man or woman, believe unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. Verse 11, for the scripture says, the scripture of the Holy Spirit, whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. Now, today the world mocks us and ridicules us and tries to ostracize us and all of those things. The day will come where they will face a terrible judgment. And I do not want that for any of them. But today they mock and ridicule. There come a day that they will, you remember the rich man with Lazarus. 
he he had he just desired just a tip of water because he was in torment and he asked Abraham, please go warn my brothers. Verse 12, for there is no difference between, here we go again, right? Between the Jew, which at that time it was either, and the argument was Jews, you had to become a Judaicite and then you could become a Christian. That was, that was nonsense. God had to show Peter through the veil of the fowls uh, several times in a vision. Then he went to Cornelius's house and they all got the Holy Spirit. So it's not Jew and Gentile. Well, there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whomsoever, not if you're white, not if you're black, not if you're brown, not if whatever color, not if you, it says, for whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord might be saved. That's not true. I said, it didn't say might be. For whoever shall call upon the name of shall be saved. So in these doubts that come, you have two areas that come. You have this carnal nature, right? The sinful nature that Paul uh, spoke about in Romans. So you have a sinful nature that opposes you. That sinful nature is influenced by evil. And then you also, as Paul said, you fight against principalities and powers. So the arena that we fight this in is over the soul. The spirit this way to influence us when you're born again, the Holy Spirit. And then on the other side is the carnal nature along with evil trying to fight over that soul. But if you belong to Jesus Christ, he says, I will keep you. I will perfect you until that day. Okay. I've got all of my notes. <laughs> to give me a... <clears throat> Don't know where I'm at on my notes. <laughs> so this is probably one of the better pictures that I have seen. Of... Jim, get to where your pictures are at. You're in Galatians. Let me, let me cover this. Where am I? <laughs> See, in our culture, Faith is frowned upon as mere imagination. The hopes and wishes of the common man. Evidence is what matters and not just any form of evidence. So the world says you're weak and you need a crutch and you're leaning on this uh, religious stuff. We are told we can only know things after they have been demonstrated time and again through stringent scientific methods. And even then, further experiments might change what we thought was true. Does that not sound like this secular realm today? The best and most prevalent evidence available, proving there is a spiritual realm, is testimonial evidence. Remember the testimony of two or more? We can look at the sheer number of religions around the world and the billions of people who focus their lives on the spiritual realm. And that's absolutely true of this family. It is likely that so many people would report encounters with the spirit and it not be real. From Roswell in 1947 to Skinwalker Ranch and legitimate Navy videos of UAPs, the view has changed of there is no spiritual realm to there's absolutely a spiritual realm. Now we don't know if it's extraterrestrials we don't know if these uh, unidentified aerial phenomena so it's all over the news and i've covered that and i said getting prepared for the great deception the best testimonial evidence for a spiritual realm is the bible itself historians both christian and non-christians agree that the historical authenticity of the bible is strong i don't look at it as being strong i look at it as being absolute the probability, statistical probability of the prophecies coming to pass of just Jesus going to the cross and Passover is astronomical. And I've covered that in the past. Jesus claimed to be God's son, the one who came down from heaven. He made this fact quite clear. John eight twenty three. <laughs> I'm all over. <laughs> so I'll show this to you in a minute. Holy Spirit, so it's showing the breakdown of spirit, small s, right? Different from 
the soul, and the body. So I want to take that and look at it in this direction, in this way. So when we die, what happens to the Holy Spirit? You're born again and filled with the Spirit. What happens to the Spirit of life? Small s, Spirit of life. And I'll show how we progress in that. What happens to the eternal soul when we breathe our last? What happens to the body? So those are some of the things we're going to try to cover this week and next week. When it comes together, it will be one of the more important foundational truths to stand on in these coming days. So where am I? <laughs> Galatians 6.15. For neither is circumcision now of any importance, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. Result of a new birth and a new nature in Christ, Jesus the Messiah. That's amplified. That word new is the Greek 2537. Recently made a new kind, unprecedented, uncommon, or unheard of. In this usage, all new things previously non existent begin to be far different than what they were before. So when he showed me, that wrecked car from the junkyard, he was showing me the process of us being sanctified. The new creation did not come from anything that existed, and I'll show you. It's entirely new. You can't take the old man and change the old man and make him something new. You're not going to take that old heart and kind of work with it and change it. Okay? So there's the word new, which is above. And the creature. So we are a new creation or creature. Okay. That's the Greek 2937, used 19 times, of individual things and beings. In this case, a man or woman regenerated through Christ. Okay. Greek 2936 of, of that, of God creating the worlds through the idea of proprietorship of the manufacturer. That's the Strong's Concordance to fabricate and create. So a manufacturer takes something from nothing and makes it. <laughs> you look at a building site, right? And it just land. And eventually there'll be a house on it. That's taking the land that was nothing and making something new. Okay. I want to make sure I'm on, on the right slides to try to keep up. I get to, I got so much in, of this in my in my spirit. It says that in our culture, faith is surrounded upon his mere imagination. I covered that. The hopes and wishes of the common man. It's not true. I mean, they can try to you know slough it off, saying, "Oh, you need a crutch." We don't need a crutch. What we're looking at is eternal life that Jesus Christ presented to us because He gave His life for it. It says the best testimonial evidence for a spiritual realm is the Bible. We see all throughout the Bible. Okay. I think I'm on my notes now. <laughs> John 8, 23. And he, Jesus, said unto them, you are from beneath. This is one of the examples in the Bible of two different realms. You have an earthly realm, and then you have the spiritual. You are from beneath. That word beneath is the Greek 2736. You are from the earth is what the word means in, in Strong's. I am from above. That word above is... The Greek 507, heaven. Okay, so I still break it down to you so you understand the original Greek. He says, you're from the earth, I'm from heaven. You are of this world, the, the, that's the Greek 2889, the whole mass of men alienated from God and hostile to Christ. So when it says, for God so loved the world, not talking about this globe, blue globe, he's talking about the masses of people then in it, that are contrary to him. You are of this world, the whole mass of men and women alienated from God. I am not of this world. So he's telling you now, he said, there's two different realms. There's a realm you're from and there's heaven above. <clears throat> the Bible recounts numerous encounters that people have had with spiritual realm. Jesus cast demons out of people regularly. You remember the, the swine, the pigs. That was a psychosis. That was some psychological problem uh, the demoniac, demoniac had uh, 
Gesheen. He was filled with thousands, so he called himself Legion. Right? And they went into pigs and the swine went in. So that wasn't some psychosis he had. That was an actual demon or demons that were possessing him. Jesus cast out demons out of people regularly, healed the sick by speaking to them, miraculously fed thousands of people, and spoke with people who should be dead. Right? Moses and Elijah. Look at Matthew 17, 1 through 3, the Mount of Transfiguration. These are all indicators that the spiritual realm is real. Okay? I think for our family, uh, we know that. But when I say this, there are so many new people joining that it's difficult for them. And they say, would you please explain this? And uh, Kimberly, I have these, all these notes and list of questions. And I said, maybe I've done two or three teachings on those. The owner's manual provided by the manufacturer. The owner's manual provided by the manufacturer. Or in our study today, the Bible offers a different position. True faith is substance. It is evident. Okay? True faith is substance. So for us, the owner's manual is the Bible. He is the manufacturer, the creator, Adam, and we are sons of Adam and Eve, right? And then once the flood came, then, you know, Noah's wife, three sons and their wives, eight people, eight people out of probably a billion that were saved. You have to think about that when you start thinking about the rapture and others. They're not, <laughs> Jesus said, broad is the way that leads to destruction and narrow is the pathway that leads to heaven. Uh, Hebrews 11, 1. And I'll cover this in just a second. Now, faith is a substance, the title deed of the things hoped for being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of the reality. That word substance, <laughs> now faith is a substance, the title deed of things hoped for, being the proof of things we do not see. The word substance in this is used one time. This is where it's used in, in uh, Hebrews. It's the uh, Greek 5287. You spell it <laughs> H-Y-P-O. S T A S I S. I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> Confidence, firm trust, and assurance. It pictures a foundation or or a substructure, something stable and unmoving on which things can be built. It's like a slab or foundation. It is the substance that gives real existence. The word <laughs> that I just spelled, H Y P O S. T-A-S-I-S, -S, was used in ancient title deeds as a guarantee of ownership. Faith is the es essence of a future reality, despite the appearance of the physical world around us. I even see that title deeds when Jacob left uh, and his bride took all the family idols and Laban came following after them. Well, in those days, it was a form of showing ownership and a title deed in these uh, idols that they had, and probably of those that were, a lot of them were frogs and <clears throat> some of those things. Many people ask me to share my, <laughs> some of the stuff he teaches me. Understand, and I'll reaffirm. For me, he has a sense of humor. I have called him for years, not in a negative way, in a very positive way. Not Jehovah Jireh, not Jehovah Tishkanu, not Jehovah Shalom, but Jehovah Sneaky, because he pulls sneakies on me all the time. And he does laugh. He does sing. He does whistle. He does dance. Uh, you need to understand he's a person, and he has a, a wonderful sense of humor. I'll show you an example of that. This goes back mm, several years. And he comes to me at night and said, I, I want to teach you on prophecy. I said, okay. He said, tell me first what, what prophecy is. I said, well, I believe it's, you know, you give somebody a word and it confirms something or talks about something that's to come. Hey, that's, that's pretty good. But let me give you an example. Now, this is the type of example he gives to a humble Cajun <laughs> charhead. Okay. I rarely, rarely show a picture that looks or imitates christ i know what he looks like i have seen him many times 
and I, I'm sure I'll see more. And I know what he looks like. People write me all the time, say, "Please describe what he looks like." And uh, th that's that's with even Kimberly and Luke. Uh, Luke has the same type of hair he has, but uh, his eyes and all—that's for me. But so uh, this one ain't bad. <laughs> he said, "All right, I'm going to teach you on prophecy and on faith." All right. So what he does. He shows me a green apple in his hand. He holds up. This is like a green apple, right? I said, okay, I'm looking and you got to think to myself, you got a green apple in your hand. Where is this going? So he smiles and he has a, a sneaky smile because <laughs> I know something's coming. He smiled and asked, what do you see? That's, this is a no brainer. I see a green apple. He said, no. Tell me again, what are you looking at? I said, I'm looking in your hand at a green apple. Nope. It's a red apple. <laughs> I'm thinking, Lord, I know the difference between a green apple and a red apple, right? He said, you're looking at a red apple. Okay. Let me show you another example. This is not the one he gave. The apple is the one he gave to me. You see a green banana and you see a yellow banana. Prophecy is seeing into the future of things not yet manifest. He said, so as a prophet, what I want you to do is when you look at something, don't look at the green apple, look at what it's going to become, right? When I see a person, then I look at them. And if the Lord shows me, I know some things about their future. I don't divulge those things because he trusts me. There was an example in the Old Testament where the prophet saw this man and just started weeping. And the guy said, what are you weeping for? He goes, I see what a monster you're going to turn out to be. And the guy, I can't believe you're saying that about me. And it proved to be true. Prophecy, seeing things that are not as though they were. That was his simple thing to me is if you see green, ask me what the, if it's something else in the future. That was the most simplest lesson that he could teach me. And then he said, I want you to do the same thing for faith. Okay. They make faith too hard. They make it difficult. Now, faith is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. So the title deed that you're holding is a red apple, right? But you don't see it yet. But you already have the image of it, that that you desire in your heart. And it is in the will of God that you are praying and asking something by faith. And it's not something that's it's within what is good for you, best for you, benefits you, benefits your family, benefits the body of Christ. In all of it, how will it glorify Christ? And then I know if that's the reason that I know I'm in the will with it when I'm praying. If it somehow will honor him, bless him, and he wants to bless us. He wants to bless us. So he gave me a simple lesson of an apple to see the prophecy of the future, the banana, put anything that ripens, and then faith. He says, own it now, because if you won't look and say, Lord, I, I got it in my mind. I, I want a red apple. You'll get a red apple. Please don't laugh. <laughs> I'll laugh at myself. There is more to the physical world than meets the eye. The writer of Hebrews tells us that our faith is not merely a hope or a fiat system of currency. Fiat, so I've taught on that, is the money we have today. It's backed by nothing. It's paper. It's not worth a thing other than what a couple cents of paper costs. Our hope is or a fiat system of currency. <clears throat> Our faith is not a dream. It's not a wish. And it's certainly not a fantasy. It is reality. I love you in the Lord. And I want you to take a hold of this and say it's. If you have to go along and say it's kind of silly. But I'm going to go ahead and think of the apple. <laughs> and I'm looking at it. And that's what I'm praying for. Our faith is substance. 
it is evidence. Hope must have a foundation. That foundation is scripture. And the work of the Holy Spirit in our hearts gives me and gives you confidence in the events still future and unseen. I don't know what the house li looks like. <laughs> I'm praying for a nice one. I don't know all the exact details of it, but Kimberly and I and Luke are praying like, you have a place for us picked out. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews tells us readers that they must wait patiently. Nobody has patience anymore. And don't pray for patience. Tribulation work with patience. So don't pray for patience. <laughs> the writer of Hebrews tells us reader they must wait patiently until the word of God comes to pass. But even their faith demonstrates the reality of the things that are not yet seen. So don't go to the microwave oven, push one for a real one minute. It ain't going to work that way. Give it to the Father that loves you more than life itself because he gave you his life. He gave me his life, Luke and Kimberly. The life of the believer is lived in the assurance of another reality. One this world does not understand, will never understand. A reality outside the realm of our immediate experience. Although we cannot reach out and grab the future God has promised us, the person, he or she, of faith is convinced of its substance. It will come to pass. Um, <laughs> I'm praying for the young lady to go to Tucson and enter the medical school for trained to be a surgeon. Uh, you want to be a, a surgeon, you stick to what the Lord put in your heart all these years and don't let anybody deter you. The things we can see are made from things that are not visible. Boy, that'll get some people. The things that we can see are made from things that are not visible. I tell you what we live in, and it's too deep to get into, but we live in a digital digital world of zeros and ones. Even from a completely secular view, this is true. Just within this past century, scientists have been able to explore the exceedingly small building blocks of our physical world, moving down past the cell to the universe of subatomic particles. We cannot see them but we know they are real. They are framed by the Rima, the spoken word of God. So there are things micros microscopic that are real, but we can't see them. Uh, right now with the television waves, the radio waves, cell phone waves, they're here, they're real. Um, your phone rings, you didn't see the signal, but it's there. It's the same thing. And I look forward to getting to teaching the different realms and where heaven is in that realm and where uh, the realm of darkness is. Remember it says in the end that they warfare and then are cast down to heaven. I mean, to earth. Things can be seen made from things that aren't visible. Okay. Second Corinthians 418. While we look not at the things which are seen, back it up all the time with scripture. So you can go to scripture. While we look at the things that which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, physical, spiritual, seen, physical, unseen, spiritual, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 through 13. But God had revealed them unto us by his spirit. That's the reason I can see visions and things be taken up in the spirit for the spirit searches all things yea the deep things of god first corinthians 2 verse 11 for what man knows the things of a man save the spirit small s of man which is in him even so the things of god knows no man but the spirit of god capital s spirit of god verse 12 now we have received not the spirit of the world small s of the world but the spirit, which is of God, what we're going to talk about today, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, given to you, promised to your loved ones. Verse 13, which things also we speak, not in the word, words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 
I'm going to break some of those down. You know, I am on studying going back to the original. So let me see where I'm on my slides. I'm on 16. My next note thing. I taught on this before. Metamorphosis, right? So you take a monarch butterfly from a caterpillar stage all the way through. And you can see when the butterfly is finding its way through that cocoon, it has to fight to strengthen its wings. If it does not fight, the wings are not strong enough to fly. I read an article where a person was watching that happen, so he slid it open to help the butterfly out. And when the butterfly came out, the wings were too weak and it couldn't fly. The Lord is not going to intervene before he knows it's done his work so that we can fly. Okay? All of this is for a reason. Why? A new creation in Christ. He wants you spiritually, the beauty that he sees in you. That's what I love about Kimberly. She's still beautiful to me. But even as she, like for fine wine, <laughs> uh, she's still beautiful. But on the inside, it's becoming more and more and more like Christ. And look at his age. It's the same way. And it's the same way for you, my, my sister, my brother, grandmother, grandfather. He is going to make something beautiful of your life. May not look like it now. Whatever stage, <laughs> you know, you're in on there. One day, one day. Either we'll be caught up with him or we'll be in the resurrection. Okay? So new creation. Metamorphosis. Where am I? <laughs> John 1, 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons and daughters of God. <laughs> I'll go back to that. <laughs> Please give me some grace. Accept my apologies. I get to talk and I get so excited to be with you and just share things. It, it just comes out. A lot of times in my notes, others I've just, I've known it for years. John 1, 12 through 13, but as many as received him, not a few, any of them received him. To them gave he power to become the sons and daughters of God. You remember B'nai Elohim? The B'nai Elohim, the sons of God. And I said the B'nai Elohim all are created. We're not created. Adam was created. We're made in the image of Adam. But there will come a day where we will be the sons of God and the daughters of God as Adam was. <clears throat> That's what it means, the sons of God. To them that believe on his name. There is such an incredible future for us. And when people are talking about, you know, flowers and lollipops and bubble baths and all that's not satisfying. What's satisfying to me and worth going through it is he is making something beautiful out of each one of us, not of our own doing, but out of his doing. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but God. Okay. John 12, 1, 12 through 13. But as many as received him, them gave he power to become the sons and daughters of God, even to them that believe on his name. Verse 13, which were born not of blood, natural birth, nor the will of the flesh, natural birth, nor the will of man, but of God. Our new birth was brought about by the will of God, our Father. We did not inherit the new nature from our parents or decide to recreate ourselves anew. Neither did God simply clean up our old nature. He created something entirely fresh and unique. The new creation is completely new. Talk about you. Put in there, say, I am a new creation. Put your name in these things. I'm talking to you in our living room, your living room. Or in your trailer, or in your auditorium, in your car, I, I, in your jail cell. I'm talking to you. The new creation is completely new, brought about from nothing. 
just as the whole universe was created by God, ex anilo, N-I-H-I-L-O. I think I have that. Let me see if I can find that. <laughs> There's the metamorphosis. There's the sons of God. See John 1, 12 through 13, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That word creature, as I gave to you, of individual things and beings. In this case, a man regenerated through Christ. Okay. Of God creating the worlds. And down is John 1, 12 through 13, which we just covered. And there's that word that I, the new creation is completely new, brought about from nothing, just as the whole universe created by God. E-X, next word, N-I-H-I-L-O, it says out of or from nothing is the term. Only our creator could accomplish such a feat. Okay, so let's look at Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Who is the image of the invisible God? You remember they, they're sitting around and, I'm glad that Philip and Thomas had the nerve to ask him. Everybody else was probably wondering the same thing. He said, Jesus, uh, show us the Father. <laughs> Jesus said, you're looking at him. You see me, you've seen the Father. Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Who is the image of the invisible Father, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all, I've covered this so many times, and I'll continue, were all things created. So when you think Genesis 1, okay? In the beginning, God. What does Colossians say? For by him, Jesus Christ, were all things created, Genesis 1, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, that's a ranking of angelic, dominions, powerful ranking angelic, or principalities. Paul said we war against principalities. Many do not have wars against principalities, but uh, demonic forces beneath the principality. There's a principality over every nation. There are principalities over major cities. Dominions, principalities, or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Verse 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things are held together. They consist, is what King James says. 18. And he is the head of the body. The church, that word church, there it is, the body. This new body is ecclesia. So he's the head of this body, not Jew or Gentile, male or female, the ecclesia. Who is the beginning? The firstborn from the dead. That in all things he might have preeminence. Verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. The fullness of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross. Remember anybody who hangs on uh, a tree is accursed. By him to reconcile all things unto himself. Not some things, all things unto himself. By him. I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. <laughs> Firstborn from the dead. Have you ever wondered about that? There's a teaching within a teaching within a teaching when I teach. This is one of those. Bereans. I've always wondered. I'm like, why are you the firstborn from the dead? I know of five people or five that were raised from the dead. Can you think of them? Five that were raised from the dead. Think about it. Mississippi 1, Mississippi 2, Mississippi 3, Mississippi 4. Mississippi. Who were they? There was a soldier that when he was killed, he was cast down into a grave where Elisha's bones were, and it was the last confirmed miracle of Elisha. Elijah did eight. That made the 16th, right? Then there was the widow's son who died, who went found the prophet, said, you promised me this son, and now the son is dead. So he came, laid upon him, and sneezed and, uh, several times, and the Boy's life was restored. Old Testament. What's the New Testament? Jesus happened one day to be walking by a, a funeral procession. He knew all things. She was a widow, couldn't pass on their lineage. A little boy in the casket 
He stopped by, raised him from the dead. Uh, uh, the daughter of Jairus uh, said, can you come and see? All the weepers and mourners and stuff. And he said, she's asleep. And I all started laughing and mocking him. So he went in there and raised her from the dead and said, hey, give her something to eat. Right? Well, it was the other. Well, we all know Lazarus. Why is he the first from the dead? Revelation 1 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his blood. The first of the dead who was raised to life was the Son of God, long before those who, by his agency and merits, are exalted to the nature and dignity of sons of God or daughters of God, with the added suggestion of the supreme rank by which he excels these other sons and daughters. So does that mean he is the first from Romans eight seventeen says that you and I are joint heirs in Christ. And in other words, he, in another place, he said, he is not ashamed to call us his brethren. Okay. As stated by Peter, Jesus is indeed before those who by his agency and merits are exalted to the nature and dignity of the sons of God. Okay. Well, that's confusing. Let me unconfuse that. First Peter 1, 19 and 20. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and spot, the word as being as a lamb without blemish and spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. When was he slain? Before the foundations of the world. So he was also resurrected. I'll tell you in just a second why. But that's Jesus. What about you? What about me? Ephesians 1, 4 through 6. According as he hath chosen us. Put your name in there. In him. When? When did he choose you? Last week? 47, 48 years ago? No. <laughs> According to his, he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. That's when he chose you. That's when he knew you. Remember he told Jeremiah, I, I see you being formed in the womb. I knew you and I called you to be a prophet. He knew Jeremiah before the foundation of the world. He knows you the same way. But that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Verse 5, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us acceptable in the beloved. So Jesus was crucified before the foundation of the world, and you and I were chosen before the foundation of the world. But also, why is he the first begotten from the dead? Think of the body that he appeared with at the resurrection. That body was not, right, flesh and blood. It had bone, flesh and bone, right? The soldier, the little boy or the widow, the little boy in the New Testament, the, the daughter of Jairus and Lazarus, when they came back to life, they still had their old body, right? Still had their old body and they died. Jesus came and he gave us an example of what it's going to be like for you and I because he had a different body, a new body. That body could eat. That body could disappear. That body could change his appearance. That body could walk through walls and doors. <laughs> so it, it was just a question of year. Why are you the first forgotten of the dead? There's many that not the same. I have one other just to give you an alert to. Okay. There are many things out that shroud other things that people may come forward and say, you know, it was the Lord. And I had studied it and it showed that, you know, it confirms it because it shows where his wrists were in it. I did a teaching on this, but let me confirm something for you. 
when I go through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and even the Apocrypha, I take it and break it down as you know, Hebrew, Greek, uh, Chaldean, Aramaic, whatever it is. First one from the dead in the succession of time, sequence, resurrection, body, he had no blood. Okay. Luke 24, 39, was it his wrist or his hands? The reason I go back to the original is because I want to know what the original word was in the Hebrew or in the Greek, Septuagint and others. Luke 24, 39, look at the marks in my hands and my feet and see that it is I am. Touch me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have amplified. He's quoting Psalms, Psalms twenty two sixteen, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierced my hands and my feet. I think Jesus, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit upon David and Luke, would have said, my wrist and my feet. It's important to get it right. His hands and his feet. I know of a couple that have had legitimate visits to heaven because I can ask them questions and they will say um, something about his hands. Not his, not his wrist. It's important when you see things being shown as authentic, just remember the scriptures and all the scriptures. Word hands, I'm saying I think he knew the difference between his hands and wrist. Hands is the Hebrew 3027 and the Greek 5495. This is the definition that I the terminal part of the human arm located below the forearm used for grasping and holding and consisting of the wrist, palm, forefingers, and opposable thumb on the other side. And the feet is Hebrew 7270 and Greek 4228. There are little things that are important as we get to the future and deceptions come. Uh, I always have to go further, right? Strong's Concordance. Yad, Y-A-D, 3027. You can see the word hand <laughs> and the different uses of the word of the hand. Psalms 1824, Psalms 1834, Psalms 2216, Psalms 282, Psalms 143.6 to show you, to confirm when I look at it. My hands and my feet, right? Hands and my feet to show you that. They're the uh, scriptures that showed the two I quoted. So when I take you through these things, first begotten of the dead, and also say, well, you know, hands and wrists is important, especially if go back and look at the shroud of turn and what they're saying or other things that are coming. Where am I? <laughs> A new creation Christ. Paul writes about the symbolism of death and a resurrection in Romans. Romans 6.6. 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Okay. So with that, let me say, second, old things have passed away. The old refers to everything that is part of our old nature carnal pride, love of sin, reliance on works, and our former opinions, habits, and passions. Most significantly, what we love have passed away, things of this world, especially the supreme love of self, and with it, self-righteousness, self-promotion, and self-justification. The new creature looks outwardly towards Christ instead of inwardly towards self. The old things died, nailed to the cross with our sinful nature. As a new creation in Christ, Paul writes about the symbolism of death and our resurrection in Romans. Okay. And then I quoted Romans. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, the desires of the flesh that I read to you. Look at Galatians 3.27. 
For as many of you have been baptized into Christ and put on Christ. The word bap- baptized is baptismo, submerged, immersion. Okay, Galatians 3.27. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 2. Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all of our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Okay, you remember when they went through the Red Sea? What is Paul equating that to? And were baptized unto Moses in the cloud and the sea. That word baptized, as I said, the Greek 907. Immerse or to submerge, different than sprinkling. I think I was sprinkled, you know, my mother, I said, grew up Catholic when I was a baby. Then in college, I got baptized out in a lake. <clears throat> New creation in Christ. The old man, talking about now, is dead. And you'll see where we're going with this. Along with the old passing away, the newest come. <clears throat> old dead things are replaced with new things full of life and the glory of God. The newborn soul delights in the things of God and abhors the things of the world and the flesh. Our purposes, feelings, desires, and understanding are fresh and different. We see the world differently. The Bible seems to be a new book. And though we may have read it before, there is a beauty about it which we never saw before and which we wonder at not having perceived. People that read the Bible, look at it, it's just a book. You're born again, and the Holy Spirit begins to breathe and show you things. You're like, like, like a whole new book. There are times you'll be reading and things jump off the page. There are many times that you have a, and I receive us all that, during the week or during the weekend, some type of scripture has jumped out, and then we'll cover it on Thursday, and that's a confirmation. Yes, Jesus is talking to you. He's helping you. He's teaching you. We are all of us maturing. The whole face of nature seems to us to be changed when we're born again. And we seem to be in a new world. The heavens and the earth are filled with new wonders. And all things now seem now to speak of the praises of God. The things we once loved, who we now detest. The sin we once held on to, we now desire. We We now desire new things, right? Look at Romans 6, 14 through 21. Talking about there is, and this is that warfare of that old nature. The old nature is there, and it is buried with Christ and crucifixion, but it's not completely gone because it's there, right? So when you look at that, the apostle says, the apostle Paul says, the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, those are the things I do. So he comes to the conclusion, it's not me, it's that sinful nature. And then he starts Romans 8 and says, however, therefore is now no condemnation for those in Christ. He knows that we're going to be battling this thing as long as we are in this carnal nature. What about the Christians who continue to sin? Mm, Have that all the time. Questions. There's a difference between continuing to sin and continuing to live in sin, okay? Habitual sinning, living in sin, and thinking once saved, always saved, so I can go live out like a monster, but I'm saved. That's not true. It's a false doctrine that you're believing. Uh, Once you're saved and you are completely ratified in Christ and the Holy Spirit has set a seal on you, yes. It's the story of the prodigal son coming home. It was the story for my life. No one reaches sinless perfection in this life. But the redeemed Christian is being sanctified, okay? We're justified at the cross, and in this life, we're going through a process of sanctification, made set apart day by day, sinning less and hating it more each time we fail. Yes, we still sin, but unwillingly and less and less frequently as we mature. The Apostle Paul described the internal warfare as true followers of Christ, are being sanctified, not the justification of the cross. So look at Galatians. Hmm. The whole face seems to be different. 
we now deserve. Look at Romans 6, 14 through 21, how Paul describes his battle. We put off the old man in his deeds, Colossians 3, 9, and put on the new self. Created to be like God in true righteousness, holy, Ephesians 4, 24. Okay. This is the warfare we're under, and I was telling you about earlier. Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh, carnal man, lust against the spirit, capital S, and the spirit, capital S, against the flesh. And these are contrary to one or the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. It's a constant battle. The word lust, look at, is the Greek 1937. Not sexual desires in their first, but having desires that are opposed to a thing. You have desires that are opposed to the manner of life Jesus Christ wants us to live. So there is a constant battle, and, and Paul points that out in Galatians. The carnal man fights against the Holy Spirit in us, the spirit man, to influence the soul. Okay? Where am I? The seen and the unseen spiritual realm. The Bible gives us a great many hints about the unseen world around us, a world beyond our physical eyes. We know that angels and demons work behind the scenes, hidden from us by our spiritual blindness. We know that after the resurrection, Jesus was able to walk through walls. There's that resurrected body. These give us hints about the greater dimensionality of the universe and the resurrected body of Christ. I'm covering it because you will have the same type of body. So will I. While the four dimensions of our physical space-time dominion are mysterious, we are told that faith is the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11.1. 1. However, two verses later, the writer says something else interesting. Okay. Hebrews 11.3. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, physical, were not made of things which do appear. Things that appear are physical. Our Father is the creator. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, Genesis 1, 1 through 3. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. It brooded over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. Genesis chapter 1. So he made something out of nothing. There was a, uh, people get in the, between 1 and 2, in Genesis 1 and 2, the gap theory. That's not for today, but I understand the gap and have taught on it. Similarly, God creates spiritual life and light in the hearts of men and changes the wicked human heart so that it can receive him. The Lord makes a promise to the Israelites while the ecclesia is changed and empowered by the Holy Spirit. So he makes a promise to Israel, and then he makes a promise to us. Acts 1.8. Okay, so this is his promise, Jeremiah 17.9. The heart is deceitfully above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So the heart is a, is a, it just says there, the heart is deceitfully wicked. You can't modify your heart. You can't try to improve your heart. Psalms 51.10 of David, create in me a clean heart of God and renew a right spirit within me. Create is something new. Don't take this old heart and regenerate. Give me a new heart. Now, where's that scriptural? Let's look at Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you. He's talking about Israel, but this applies to you and I today. Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your filthiness and all your idols. Will I cleanse you? Verse 26. Down the bottom. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh, verse 27, and I will put my spirit, small s, within you, 
and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you shall keep my judgments and do them. What is the small less? A regenerated spirit. Every man, and I have an answer that, that everything that hath breath, praise the Lord. And this is what I'm going to show you today. Okay? So if you see that, the word, uh, a new heart is the Hebrew 3820, L-E-B, the inner man or the soul. They're interesting. They talk about the heart is the soul, the inner man. And I've taught on the soul. You have the outer place of the tabernacle. Then you get into the holy place, represented by the mind, will, and emotions. Table of showbread, the um, menorah, and the, the altar of incense, emotions, prayers. On the other side is the spirit, the holy of holies. Okay? Jesus and Nicodemus. John 3, 5 through 9. This is what he's talking about. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again of water. Right? I simply say, is that baptism or is it the water that burst upon birth? Water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. He's talking about the flesh. For me personally, I believe it's the, the water uh, that burst before birth. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. So you have natural birth. And that which is born of the spirit, capital S, is spirit, small s. Okay. Regenerated your spirit. Verse 7. Marvel not that I said unto you, you must be born again. The wind blows wherein it desires, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell where it comes and whether it goes. So is everyone that is born of the spirit, capital S, spirit. Verse 9. Nicodemus answered and said to him, how can these things be? <laughs> Nicodemus was one of the greatest minds of his day. And ask the same question that science and scholars ask today. How can this be? He is perplexed. One of the most brilliant men in Israel at the time. This brings us back to becoming a new creation. Second Corinthians 5.17. And therefore, if any man be in Christ, he or she is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. In the ecclesia or the ecclesia. We, men and women, are a new enter entity, the same way that a newborn baby is a new person. The old man or woman has been buried in baptism, immersed, and a new man or woman emerges from the grave, symbolized by the immersion of water in baptism. Baptism is something that tells the world that I identify with Christ. Then he told the disciples, stay and tarry in Jerusalem until I send the power of the Holy Spirit until you are endued, clothed with power from on high. Okay. And there are some that have written and said, several people have told me that if I haven't been baptized in water, that I can't take communion. I'm giving you my opinion. Is you are born again. You have asked Jesus Christ into your heart as I did. It wasn't until a few years later that I understood baptism well enough to now I want to be baptized because I understand what it is. Before I had no clue. I just, everybody does that. And that's what you do. I'm going to get baptized, but I didn't understand what it meant. Several years later in college, remember I was saved from, you know, my sophomore year, several years later, while I was in college, the, New Life Group went out to a campsite or whatever and uh, being baptized in the lake. And I can remember it because as soon as I came up, I had an earache that lasted for the next two days. And I knew it was a not, not a normal earache. It was somebody didn't like me being baptized, I guess. You can take communion if you are born again in Christ. Just I want you to be able to understand what baptism is about. Kimberly, as a grown person, and Lou, once she understood, uh, and she and I were both raised in Baptist, once she understood what it meant, uh, she, <laughs> it's funny, it, most of them were just kids, and then she was there. And it was a beautiful scene to see her. Uh, and then Luke, at the, they had two pastors in a big tank. Uh, I think it was at Prestonwood Baptist and uh, Jack Graham. 
uh, and to see them baptized. So she understood it then. But if you are born again, examine yourself before you take communion, just the way anyone else does. The way I have to examine myself is take communion. Sonship and covenant promises, this is for you. Understand this. But So in the Ecclesia, Ecclesia, that is who we are today. This group kind of in the middle, a different type of body. So Galatians 3, 26 through 29, understand this is the key, one of them. For you are the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Therefore, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be, that the word if is not the right word. I put it there. And being that you are Christ, then you are are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. I taught on that when Abraham had offered tithings to Melchizedek, the Lord looked at that and said, although Levi was in his, his loins, he counted that as though the, Le, Le, the Levites paid homage to Melchizedek. So the Lord looks at that from a lineage standpoint, okay? So if you are in Christ and the promises that were made to Abraham, they're yours. Not those specific to Israel in the land, those who bless and curse, but the promises of Abraham. It's in Galatians. Circle it and say, I'm of Abraham's lineage, of the promise. Okay? In the relationship we have with the Lord, though the new covenant of grace, there is intimacy and fullness of life spiritual victory, and so much more. These blessings not available to those who are related to Adam, nat natural birth, born into sin, are aspects of the new life that comes to new creations in Christ. In Christ, everything is so different from how it was in Adam. The family of man having only natural life from Adam puts great significance on human heritage or personal inclinations. The family of man having only natural life from Adam, just those born in the, and everyone, all of us born, uh, put great significance on human heritage or personal inclinations. Whether a person is a Jew or a Gentile can be of enormous consequences to many among the unredeemed community. Whether a person is religiously inclined or secularly motivated avails much with many unsaved people. They don't like us, many of them. that are Well, those that are unsaved don't like us. On the other hand, those who have been brought into union with Christ can learn that God's perspective on such matters is vastly different. For in Christ, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything. Okay, In the kingdom of heaven, these distinctions among the sons of Adam mean nothing. Human differences do not cause the work of God or the will of God to be advanced or prevented. They avail nothing. What matters for all is who are in Christ Jesus. It's not a human category, but it's a category for a new creation. So when people say, are you rich, poor, black, white, brown, um, he does make the distinction between male and female. He doesn't count a male who wants to be a woman and dresses like a woman and gets hormone treatment. He doesn't do that. Same thing with a female that wants to be a male. God knows the difference between because he created them male and female, two different distinctions. Now, those that are in error and those that have gone that way, we pray for them. I met while I was in college. He was called the Black Widow of Bourbon Street, uh, was a man went through the processes uh, of becoming a female, even to an operation. And he was called the Black Widow of Bourbon Street because this person was, as a woman, very attractive in the natural sense. And he would snare men with that and destroy their lives, that, thus the Black Widow of Bourbon Street. And when I was talking with him, he visited the campus and got known, he said, 
I tried everything I could. And God sent sign after sign after sign not to do it. Don't do that. Don't do this. So I ignored him. Now he was born again and had already had surgeries, but his heart and his life was given to Christ. He was no longer the black widow of Burma Street, but he's redeemed in Christ. So those that are in that lifestyle, we can pray for them and we can love them, but we can also stand firm and say, that is not of scripture, but don't. Any hatred, any vitriol, all those things are not of us. When we come to know Christ by grace through faith, he gives us new birth. First Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fades not away, reserved in heaven for you, your loved ones that are saved, for the scholar and for my bride. Verse 5, who are kept, how? By your efforts, by your donations, by your whatever you, you call it. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I'll cover that word again. You'll see it down at the bottom. Same chapter, 1 Peter 1, 22 through 23. Seeing that you have purified your souls and obeying the truth of the Spirit, capital S, unto unfeigned love to the brother, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Verse 23. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which lives and abides forever. You're not born a semen that men have to the process from Adam. That's why they are doing everything they can from robots and trying to say they have a soul of uh, creating incubator babies. And if I started sharing some of those things, many of you wouldn't believe it. So I'll wait until the time and document it and show proof. Not of the natural way. So if you are born the natural way because you are offspring of Adam, because when he sinned, the war was declared, the seed war, Genesis 3.15, and the seed of the woman, which a woman has an egg, so it was prophesying of the virgin birth, the seed meaning Jesus, would crush the head of Satan. And many overlook and, and don't see that is also the seed of Satan. So it's a seed war from Genesis 3.15. So they're doing everything they can. That is what Genesis 6 was about with uh, the B'nai Elohim, the watchers that came down, okay? And that whole thing. It was the same thing with the tribes, that the 10 tribes that had a polluted gene pool, when Moses and Joshua were told to go in and destroy those villages, those towns, uh, everything in it is because they had contaminated seed from, uh, it says, in the days of Noah, uh, that before the flood and after the flood were the giants, okay? It's in the scripture. It's in the scripture. So look at the word. Don't, don't look at me. Don't look at somebody else that has an opinion of the, the Seth thing with the daughters of Adam. Study on your own. People write me stuff and then I'll show them it's like, oh, don't hear back from them. And I don't too many times, but if they are believing something that could harm their walk with Christ, I'll point it out and document it. And it's like, oh, not say I love you too much to allow you to be harmed by some of those things that are being taught. Okay, being born, that word again, used twice, just used twice, New Testament, is the Greek 313, to produce again, to be born again, <laughs> not renewed, not refurbished, born again. You had 
the birth through the womb, right? Which is one birth, and Jesus said, you have to be born again of the Spirit. Every human being, when they are born, is given the Spirit that comes upon the bones. I'll see how far we are today. I think I'm out of time, and we'll pick up starting with this in, in next time. But I'll point this out and show you where we're at. Prominent physicist Stephen Hawkins, thoughts on God, heaven, and death. Quoting him, I regard the brain as a computer which will stop working when it com components fail, he told the Guardian, quoting, there is no heaven or afterlife for broken down computers. That is a fairy, fairy story for people afraid of the dark, end of quote. Well, Stephen, not afraid of the dark. I know the dark because I'm of the light. It says at age 76 on March 14, 2018, Stephen Hawkins had the opportunity to test his theories and his passing from this life. So when you're faced with that, uh, Stephen, I'm glad you had all those theories and everything here on earth. They will do you no good where you're going because you deny the Christ. When you die to the Christ, the Father said there is no other way to get to heaven but through my son. The son asked three times in the garden of Gethsemane. He said, Father, is there any way? Is there any way around this? He met with silence. He said, not my will, but thy will be done. And after the third time, angels came and ministered to him. So to Stephen and all those others, Joel, and Oprah, and all the others, there's one way to God because it cost him everything. It cost him his only son so that you, Luke, Kimberly, and myself could come to God. It cost everything. So you say, there's a lot of ways. No, there's not. So this is where we'll pick up next week. This is what they teach. I would say 95% because they have no idea. The spirit and the soul, they don't know how to differentiate it, right? They just kind of, some place it combines it as one. They'll talk about the soul once. They'll talk about the spirit, soul with emotions, mind, and the will. And then the spirit lifts up, and there's the body. They have no idea. These are the days, in these last days, where revelation from Scripture, of truth confirmed in Scripture, is coming forth. I'm going to share those things, and to give you a heads up, where is it in Ecclesiastes, I want you to look at this. Go through every kind of translation you want. This is the translation that of all those I've gone through, this is the one I go with. Ecclesiastes 11, 5. I've taught on this before, and I'm going to teach on it again because he wants me to. As you do not know the way of the Spirit, small s, comes to the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. The spirit that comes upon the bones in the womb. God breathed upon the not in the nostrils of Adam, right? And Adam became a living soul. I'm going to show you the distinction between the soul, the small s, the body, and the big s, the Holy Spirit. Okay. So if you want, look at Ecclesiastes 11.5. And that is also where he taught me that the life is in the blood because the spirit comes upon the bones and bones are part of the uh, uh, makeup of a body that produces blood. Right? So the blood calls out. Abel's blood calls out. Blood of the saints, the martyrs call out. So we'll pick that up. Lord willing, next week, please keep us in prayers as we go out of town this week and look for a place and moving companies and all those things. But our Father is faithful. Thank you for being so good to my family. Thank you for continuing to donate and give during these difficult times. It means everything. And we do this because you make it possible. And people write, please help the staff. We don't have a staff. It's Luke and Kimberly and I. And Greg maintains the website. I haven't done anything with a website uh, since I stopped membership. I'm 
still waiting for guidance from the Lord on how to uh, make the website uh, more functional, more functional and uh, have information on there that uh, you'll probably only get through the to, through the website. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We continue to pray for you, <laughs> your families. And when I say peace, the shalom peace, so many things all around us. And I didn't get in today with Hezbollah and Iran and what he has shown me. I know what's going to happen. And I'll share that soon. I've seen it three years ago and I caught on it and I still see what's happening. Pray for your safety. Not only from, you know, somebody wrote me after last week and said, Jim, you're right on the tuberculosis is everywhere. And then on the earthquakes, the next day, that Friday, New Jersey had an earthquake that they hadn't had in that area in 200 years. And uh, I think Luke told me that 18 or 20 uh, aftershocks after that, and that will continue for the next few months. I share those things. I don't like sharing them. I don't, I don't like some of the things I see because I love this nation. I love its people. But when the Lord tells me to speak on those things, it's going to happen and more so. And watch for some volcanoes that are. <laughs> so I showed Kim the other day, somebody, one spewing like rings or something up in the air. But we love you in the Lord Jesus Christ until I see you the next time. God bless.